Welcome back to Seeker Strength, welcome back to Seeker Stan, and welcome to a bit of a delve into some sports science. So last week we put up a video or a short of Ardi Savea doing some jump testing or reactive strength index testing. We don't know exactly what they were looking at, but he was using dual force plates, he was in the gym, and he was doing a vertical jump on them. Now, we had a lot of comments on this, around 20 comments asking about it, asking about some of the things we brought up in the video as to the relative effectiveness of each of these measurement techniques. And today we're going to really dive into it as to why the force plate is the way you should be measuring your vertical jump if you're equipped to be able to do that. Now, so the really unfortunate thing here is there's a bit of a Dunning-Kruger effect going on. People will have a small amount of background knowledge around kind of testing within sport, particularly jump testing within sport, what their own particular sport will use, what they might have used in the past, and then they'll feel some way attacked if that's not the best method. Now, what we're here to do today isn't to rag on anyone, isn't to pick on anyone. We're really just going to clear up how these tests work, what these tests use, and why some of the other testing methods aren't really that effective, and what might be most effective for you if you want to test yourself or test your athletes in the future. So how these plates work is by using something called a piezoelectric crystal. So this is basically a crystal. When you compress it, it produces a very small electrical charge. Now, within each of these plates, you have multiple crystals set up. Some are set up in the X, Y, and Z directions. So each direction will have a different series of crystals set up there, and you'll get a very accurate measurement in all three dimensions. Now, what happens when we measure a vertical jump using a force plate is not that we have a force measurement as the person is standing on it, and then once that standing stops, so basically the person is in the air, it's not that a timer starts then. What we're really looking for is that initial force, and what we're looking for is an impulse that that force creates, so the amount of force being produced in a certain amount of time. Now, the vertical height trajectory is calculated based on that. It is not calculated based on the amount of time you're in the air or anything along those lines. That is why this measurement technique is the most accurate measurement technique we have for the vertical jump. It completely takes away the ability for an athlete to cheat the jump by tucking their legs up or bending their knees or delaying that landing in any way. Now, what we see in the other measurement techniques or the other common measurement techniques are certain areas in which the, the test itself can be manipulated. So the first and most common vertical jump measure we see is the jump and reach test. So if you've ever done one of these, you'll set up underneath, the tester will ask you to reach as high as you possibly can, and they'll get a starting measure for that. Now, in some setups, in the slightly less correct way of doing it, they'll measure your height, they'll measure the length of your arms, they'll get this measurement where you're not even fully reaching. Now, this comes with multiple, multiple measurement errors. So the first measurement error is just when you're in the air and reaching, you get a far different height than when you are just standing on your two legs and reaching. And even if we look at these videos of multiple athletes jumping, you'll see their hips, their back, their torso, their shoulder lines, everything changes to change the actual height that that top finger tips on the vertical jump tester. So that's the first thing, is there is an actual change in the starting measurement. It's not like you jump in the air, your shoulders stay square, and you just reach one hand straight up like that. Now, there are undoubtedly advantages to this form of measurement as well in the fact that you have direct incentives around the jump. You have something very tactile, you have something you can really reach up there and get, and when we go for multiple jumps in a row, you're not just relying on a feeling of that jump was better or that jump was worse. You have a very real-time feedback of, okay, I know I'm going to hit that next finger that's coming out there, I'm going to really reach up and grab it. Now, the second most common form of testing is a rudimentary jump mat. And the rudimentary jump mat, they come in many different forms. They're not that cheap, but what's actually happening on most of those jump mats is a timer starts when the body weight comes off of the mat, and a timer ends when the body weight comes back down on the mat. Now, this is what a lot of people in the comments think is happening on a force plate. So this is where we can see those cheats. This is where we can see those numbers being manipulated slightly. So the example here is I stand onto the jump mat. I dip and drive and jump as high as I can. That timer is running as I'm in the air. A rudimentary trajectory calculation is done on that. Once my 
feet hit that mat again, there's a registration of force, and then it's the total time I'm in the air they'll use to calculate that trajectory. Now, everybody knows how these can be cheated. You can tuck your knees up into your chest. You can really delay that landing as much as you possibly can, thus elongating that trajectory time and getting a higher jump value because of that. Now, it goes without saying, all of these testing systems are useful. Depending on what you have in your club, at your university, at whatever time you're there, they can all be useful as long as we have consistency of testing across every testing session. Now, this is where the vertical jump, the reach up and tap it, one actually has quite a few more fallbacks, is that the athletes will tend to have drastically different ranges of motion, depending on how fatigued they are, depending on how many times they've done the jump, depending how good they are at jumping up and reaching. A uh, good thing came up of you, it requires a bit more coordination. Obviously, most skilled athletes will be coordinated enough to jump and reach at the top of the apex uh, to the best they possibly can. But if you have a, sh a sore shoulder, maybe you're a bit tighter, maybe you played a game the day before, which will obviously change the jump values in itself, but you might never be thinking about that external rotation in your shoulder being important. You might never think about that tweak in your shoulder influencing those values. Now, the second time that that test-retest validity comes up is with the jump mat. So the rudimentary thing, we're just looking at times of the jump. Depending on the mechanics of that jump, depending if an athlete is tucking their knees or not, we get drastically different times from session A to session B to session C. So does it really matter? Well, no, it doesn't really matter if we're super consistent. Maybe if you have a video and you review what they did the first time versus what they did the second time. In my experience, with all the athletes we've dealt with, with all my time testing people, there's a lot of variation in between and a lot of the changes we get in vertical jump height are due to measurement error. Now, the final thing that people questioned is a mention of ecological validity. So ecological validity, when we look at scientific testing, is how close the scientific testing is to the actual event we're looking to test or scrutinize. So let's just take the vertical jump in basketball as a test. We want to see how good an athlete is at a running jump into dunk a basketball or into a layup shot. Now, what ecological validity comes to the forefront with the force plate is, in most anatomy and kinesiology labs, we'll be able to move those force plates around, set them in different areas of the room. So if we have to have a run in and jump, we can do that. If we want to set it out at the end of a long jump track, we can do that. If it's a triple jumper, we can do that. If it's a high jumper, we can do all those things. The athlete, for the most part, will have changed nothing about how they're jumping, where they're jumping, the actual style in which they jump, what equipment they have on them as they're jumping. Now, when we look at the other things, when we look at that uh, stand and reach jump, we're really not testing anything all that important. Maybe if we have a receiver and they're practicing catching that high ball, then maybe it's ecologically valid. But for the most point, it's very rare an athlete will be standing on two legs, dipping and driving and jumping as high as possible. Now, ecological validity also comes up when we look at the linear force transducers or anything where we have things attached to the body. So it might just be a very light, inextensible string we have on a hip belt. It doesn't make a massive difference, but ecological validity, if you're looking for gold standard of testing, is not as good as if you were just standing on a force plate. Now, this goes the same for one of the other highly accurate measurements of vertical jump height, and that is 3D motion analysis. So getting somebody fully wearing skins, long, uh, long skins the whole way down to the wrists and the whole way down to the ankles, and putting multiple markers on them. For most athletes, wearing that is really weird. I've done it a lot at different points throughout my university and post-grad work. I've done it doing power cleans, vertical jump. I've done it doing mid-high pulls as much as possible. It is just a bit different. These are obviously small changes, but a lot of the ecological validity stuff also comes in. We're looking at how easy it is to bring an athlete in test them and get them out the door again. So vertical jump is an important thing to measure, but the force plate and ideally dual force plates is the best way possible to measure it. 
If you'd like more details, please ask about it down in the comments below. If you have specific questions, you can contact us, seekastrength at gmail.com. Now, if you want stronger legs to get your vertical jump higher, we cannot recommend the Road to Anywhere squat program range highly enough. Whether you want eight weeks of programming or 12 weeks of programming, if you want a bigger 1RM on your squat numbers, that is the best possible way to get it. You can try them out for free, download the app down below. You don't have to pay anything. You just sign up to the free trial and you're good to go.